Hey, Breaking Points, Marshall here. We are going to talk about TikTok today going into 2023. I've got an awesome guest that you guys have probably listened to if you listen to the realignment. I'm speaking of Chris Fenton, he's the author of Feeding the Dragon, Inside the Trillion Dollar Dilemma, Facing Hollywood, the MBA, and American Business. Okay, so Chris, let's just get the intro here. What is your framing on what TikTok's legality national security context is going to look like going into 2023? Well, look, I mean, the number one thing about TikTok is that it really has to be looked at as a national security concern. And it's, to me, it's very obvious. I mean, I'm a soft power, I guess, specialist having come out of the Hollywood media space and seeing how things work in China. I talk about soft power, soft power influence around the world at whether it's the National War College or at USC. This is a space I know. The tech Technology is one thing, influence is the other. And I think what we really need to do is set the debate, not just around where this big data is stored, which has been a big part of the conversation, even back when Donald Trump was talking about, we want to have that stored here, let's do it through Oracle, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, that's a big part of the issue. But the other part of the debate, and a part of the debate that we have about all social media in general, is how much influence TikTok has, and in particular, how much influence it has with people under 30 that are digesting it uh, hours by hours every single day. That is something that we really need to talk about more. And I have plenty of specifics to talk about how China does that if we want to dive into it. Yeah, let me just ask the obvious question which listeners are thinking about right now, which is, okay, young people are scrolling through Meta, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, what, how do you kind of delineate the national security aspect of those three parts of those three companies? Okay, well, first of all, if you look at the influence that social media has, we're trying to tame sort of how it's biased, right? And we're talking to Facebook about how, how do they temper it? How do they properly sort of govern the way speech is talked about on that platform? Twitter the same way. I mean, that's been the headline quite constantly over the last month with Elon Musk's ownership. But at the very least, these platforms are owned and operated here in the United States of America. And that's the big difference about Biden. Light dance and its company, TikTok. TikTok is actually controlled by China. It is owned by China. And China, as you know, is run by Beijing. There's one time zone in all of China, and that's what time it is in Beijing. So even if you're a private company, you do report to the Chinese Communist Party and ultimately to the Ministry of Propaganda if you're in the space of media or social media uh, influence or even press or even the movie business like I was a part of. So there's a lot of dictation from Beijing on what they want to see TikTok doing and the way it's operating around the world. And there's a big reason why TikTok is not even allowed inside of China. It's that powerful. And what's the Chinese version of TikTok? I know it has a different name, but what is, what's the difference between the American version and the Chinese version? Well, the Chinese version is, is programmed essentially to amplify things that are much, and it's not under the name TikTok, but it's, 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 programmed essentially to amplify things that help youth become better citizens in the eyes of the Chinese Communist Party. So there's a lot of educational videos on there. There's a lot of things that explain how to become a better citizen in the way the hierarchy is looked at inside a communist part inside the communist country there. Um, it definitely censors and it definitely tempers things that aren't perfectly on party line. And they're extremely good at it. And if you look at the way for instance, the Twitter files have come out and the way things have been tempered here just on that platform by a U.S. company for U.S. people to digest. You can only imagine how much China is amplifying terrible events or terrible videos or things that divide our country and how much they abate or mitigate the things that actually bring us together and make us stronger as a country. So there's a big new committee on China that's going to be chaired by Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin. How are bipartisan leaders in Congress thinking about the threats you're describing, their general approach to governance of the question? How should we think about that going into the new year? 
Well, I think number one is they're talking about the big data issue, which we, which everybody has discussed, right? And that is something that needs to be figured out quickly if we're not going to fully ban the the platform. So that let's put aside. That's a debate. And that's real quick, before going. we put that aside, then for listeners who are just checking into this issue, like what is that big data? debate issue, quote unquote, then we'll move on to the right. other one you're focused so on. So we all know how Facebook or Twitter or even whatever you shop off of collects cookies or collects different parts of data and why they suggest certain things that you didn't even think you wanted to buy or things you didn't want to read. And you see it in your ticker on the side of your computer and you're like, oh, that's a great idea. Let me buy that. Oh, let me read that. You know the power of that influence, right? Well, all of that data that is harvested by American companies or Western companies is also harvested by TikTok itself and ByteDance. And all of that data is actually stored in China on servers over there. So in a lot of ways, you could say, well, why is my 15-year-old daughter watching dance videos really matter? Well, you know what? It probably doesn't. Probably 99% of the stuff they do on TikTok doesn't. But that other 1%, which is uh, the accumulation of everybody else in this country, goes into these servers. And at some point, AI technology is going to get to the level where it can really be weaponized against us. And that's one of the issues that everybody brings up, is that we want to bring these servers over here. We want it completely firewalled from being inside of China and having Beijing have access to it. But the other part of the equation is the influence side. And the, just to give a couple of things, because it always sounds really like you're, uh, I don't know, tinfoil hat talking about how <laughs> pernicious you know they can be with influence. But we know from even the Twitter files how easy it is to adjust the scales, to rebalance the way people are digesting information, way to amplify it, way to censor it, et cetera. Well, if you go to China, it's that much more times 100, right? When I was there shooting Iron Man 3 in December of 20, uh, it was 2012, 10 years ago, the Sandy Hook massacre occurred. And you would think, wow, that's something that no one would want to see in, in China and would be censored. But the exact opposite occurred. Out of every 30-minute telecast of news, 25 minutes of it was about the Sandy Hook massacre. And why is that? Because they really wanted to showcase the United States as a very dangerous system to live under, one that is cowboy, one that is reckless, one is very violent. And they loved amplifying that story as tragic and terrible as it was. The same thing happens if you're watching CNN in your hotel room, which you're allowed to have access to. Stories that are not very good about the Chinese government or about China in general are completely blank on your screen. You don't see a single thing. So that is censorship taken to the next level where they just completely make sure you're not aware of a story they don't want you to know of. And the one last thing I'll bring up, and I was there to witness it, was during the Jasmine Revolution Tibetan, uh, some very big Tibetan protests in 2011, 2012, coming out of the great financial crisis, there was a lot of kindling sparkling around China. And what did China do? They amplified a rally around the flag story, which was essentially taking the, the takeover of Sin, the Senkaku Islands by Japan and making that into essentially a defense national security issue for China. And China actually started shooting water cannons from Coast Guard boats, et cetera, et cetera. And that story proliferated all around the country to the point where they were throwing Molotov cocktails at Japanese consulates. They were overturning Toyotas and Nissans in the streets of Shanghai. So it's just an example of censorship, amplifying propaganda, and amplifying explosive rally around the flag propaganda. And that is the same stuff they can do here inside of our own borders at the United States of America. So two last big questions. So number one, what do you think should be done then? Like, what's your personal recommendation for how we should think about this going into the new year? Well, as an American, I just flat out think, we should not allow something that is this powerful an influence on people under 30 allowed in this country. And in fact, we have Silicon Valley, we have masterminds at this type of creation. In fact, you could argue maybe Facebook's Instagram is a great replacement for it, but we should follow India's lead and flat out just ban the app. And I don't care about the whole, oh, well, that's government overreach and free markets and capitalism and all that kind of stuff. It's not. 
national security issues should always come ahead of capitalism, always come ahead of free markets, and quite frankly, always come ahead of any sort of political side that you're on. We are all one nation, and we need to actually address the things that make us stronger as a nation. And I can tell you emphatically that China will find any story that divides us, red, blue, purple, you name it, and they will amplify it all over anything that they control. You know, this is interesting because I really can't recommend uh, your book, Feeding the Dragon, enough in terms of the memoir aspect, right? Talking about how you really saw like intercultural exchange as a way to tamp down tension and have a more peaceful relationship. Could you talk to the contradiction then almost? How in 2012, 2013, you're thinking about Iron Man 3, how this is a real harmonious combination of two different cultures and industries. But today we're talking about bands. Like, what's your recommendation for how policymakers could think? Think about the cultural soft power side of this that could amp down tensions, maybe. Well, we need to figure out how to coexist with the other superpower across the Pacific. Coexistence is the key. I mean, we do not want war. We don't want Cold War. And I know there's debates about whether we're in Cold War. But one way to do that is obviously trade and commerce. And I believe there is a very strong rebalancing of the capitalistic endeavors between the two countries that can be done where national security interests are protected and the values and the principles that we hold dearly are protected. We also see the rules and the laws starting to navigate this. And we're seeing like the SEC essentially approach Chinese listed companies and saying, you have to apply the same accounting practices to your companies as we do with ours. If you want access to our capital markets, um, there's various ways we can work with the WTO to re-designate China as a developed nation, not a developing nation. And there's various other very macro moves that we can do that will reset it immediately. We just need to put patriotism before capitalism and realize that the art of war is a long game that Beijing plays. And they're very subtle when it comes to influence. And that influence can create little sparks of division between all of us. And they know that. And it's a lot of stuff that we can't even really see in real time. But if you look at it over the course of, say, my tenure with China and going back to 2012 to today, a lot of it starts to make sense. And you're going, hey, this is not some sort of conspiracy theory. It's actually the way they compete and it's the actual the way they're looking to win. So we just need to play the game as smart as them and figure out how to rebalance this and make it more of a 50-50 divide. And last but not least, do you have a prediction for whether 2023 will mark a turning point for the TikTok ban conversation? Because we've been having this same conversation since basically 2019 across two different administrations, what do you think could change the kind of loop we seem to be stuck in? I think it's it's the same thing that I've seen on a very micro scale with me. When I started talking um, a little hawkish about China, um, it was really only the right side of the aisle that wanted me on platforms talking about it. But now it's very even. Um, it's even distribution between left and the right. And if you expand that in a macro point of view, China is probably the one issue that both sides of the aisle are agreeing upon when it comes to Washington, D.C. So where I see the 2023 version of this TikTok discussion that, like you said, has been going on for, say, five years I think it's going to move forward to some sort of constructive resolution, mainly because both sides of the aisle are now on it, talking about it, and want to solve the issue. Good show. Chris, thank you so much for joining us on Breaking Points. Can you just shout your book out for any listeners who want to go a little deeper? Yeah, my pleasure. Follow me at the Dragon Feeder on on, tic, on, on TikTok. <laughs> no, on Twitter. <laughs> And uh, Feeding the Dragon Inside the Trillion Dollar Dilemma Facing Hollywood, the MBA, and American Business is the name of the book. Thanks so much for having me on and keep doing what you're doing. You guys are fantastic. Thanks, Chris. We could edit that out, but that was a fun little Freudian slip for uh, listeners. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>